Hey YouTubers, Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. Um, I'm going to press on reading our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. Uh, we're on Chapter 7, the title of which is called Nuclear Reactors. So let's just get right to it. Since we were at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in Livermore, California, our major concern had been with nuclear explosive devices. The reports that we had written were related to the dosage to man that would result from the application of nuclear explosives and the various ill-conceived engineering projects of the Plowshare program. At the same time, we knew that our general approach would be readily applied to the nuclear reactor industry. We began to turn our attention to the burgeoning nuclear power industry, industry subsequent to a symposium in March 1969 that represented the dedication of our long-awaited biomedical building at the laboratory. The title of the symposium was impressive, The Biological Implications of the Nuclear Age. As symposiums go, it was one of the worst. Professor Joseph Rotblat, what a name, Joseph Rotblat, is professor of physics, London University at St. Bartholomew's Hospital Medical College. Professor Joseph Rotblat, reviewing the published proce proceedings in the May 8, 1970 issue of Science, stated, to sum up, the reviewer is somewhat doubtful that the value of publishing these proceedings. To sum up, the, va the I'm sorry. To sum up, the reviewer is somewhat doubtful about the value of publishing these proceedings. Perhaps the main significance of the symposium is that one of the few non-AEC people who attended was Dr. Dean Abramson of the University of Minnesota. Dr. Dean Abramson is Associate Professor of Anatomy and Laboratory Medicine, University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Abramson and a small group of individuals in the Minnesota Committee for Environmental Information had helped to helped had helped fight a successful battle to get the state of Minnesota to set its own standards for radioactive releases from the proposed Monticello power reactor in the Northern States Power Company of the Northern States Power Company. The state standards were 50-fold more restrictive than those of the AEC. The AEC claims that Congress had preempted the right of the states to set such standards and forced NSP to take the state of Minnesota to court over the issue. In August 1969, at the Governor's Conference held in Denver, the governors voted unanimously to support the position of the state of Minnesota. Subsequently, a number of states have joined in the case with Minnesota and have filed the, and others have filed amicus curiae, which is friends of the court. Finally, in June 1970, the state of Maryland proposed a set of standards that are a hundredfold more restrictive than those of the AEC. As we shall see subsequently, these are wise decisions on the part of the states because the AEC standards are, to put it mildly, ridiculous. Taking a closer look at the nuclear power industry, that's the new subtitle. Because of our conversations with Dr. Abramson, we decided that we should take a closer look at the nuclear power industry. In August 1969, we received three invitations to attend conferences related to nuclear electrical power reactors. Dr. Abramson was instrumental in creating the invitations to a conference at the University of Vermont in September and to a conference at the University of Minnesota in October. Dr. Barry Commoner of Washington University in St. Louis 
was responsible for our invitation, our invitation to a symposium at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, in December. The conference in Vermont was sponsored by the governor, Dean Davis. It was a precedent setter in that it was originally planned as an AEC propaganda sideshow to be staged by the AEC Redoubtable Traveling Circus. However, the Lake Chaplain Society and the Conservation Society of Southern Vermont managed to get the governor to influence the AEC to set aside a portion of the program for a direct confrontation with its critics. Tamplin attended this, attended this conference and was one of the panel of four who confronted an equal number from the AEC. We got our first real impression of the oppressive nature of the AEC juggernaut at the meeting. Because of the way science and engineering is funded, funded in this country, most knowledgeable experts in this field are in the employ of the AEC or the power industry. It wasn't easy for the conservation groups to find their experts. They had to look for people from among those who had developed their expertise in their spare time or, or who were no longer with the AEC or the industry. It seems that few people publicly criticize their employers. The AEC, on the other hand, was reported to have brought 36 people to Vermont, including three commissioners and even Chairman Glenn Seaborg. Some were flown in by Air Force planes. Subtitle, The AEC Roadshow. Except for the panel discussion, this was a well-planned propaganda campaign paid for by the taxpayers. The AEC had a number of manned exhibits, like a carnival. It bussed school children to talks and displays on the wonders of atomic generated electricity. Moreover, the panel of critics was put at a disadvantage because the AEC show began a day earlier and then the panel discussion followed a series of talks by the AEC experts. The deck was really stacked against the critics. Seeing the taxpayers dollars used against the public in this way one quickly comes to recognize that the best way to fight City Hall is to vote its occupants out of office. Nevertheless, even with everything set in its favor, the AEC lost, it lost in this confrontation. It lost because the people of Vermont could see through the shallow presentation and recognize the evasiveness. Tamplin went to Vermont with the sole purpose of trying to get the AEC to present him with an estimate of the biological effects of exposure at the FRC Radiation Protection Guideline. The imminent failure of this attempt became obvious during the prepared remarks of the Atomic Energy Commission, Theos Thompson, who, who stated his commission's incredible position. And I quote, the maximum permissible levels are established at a point such that there is no acceptable evidence of any sort of genetic or tissue damage to any human being exposed to these maximum levels, unquote. Contrary to the, this statement with, co excuse me, contrast this statement with that of Dr. E. Eric Pokin chairman of the International Commission on Radiological Protect Protection from 1962 to 1969, and I quote, the position, re the position regarding occupational exposure and that of members of the public has clearly become very much more complex with increasing evidence as to the possibilities of occasional harmful effects even at low doses or dose rates so that it is no longer a question of recommending the levels of exposure which are safe, 
in an absolute sense, but those which can be considered as appropriately safe for the circumstances in which they are needed to be received. During the subsequent panel discussion, the following occurred. Governor Dean C. Davis. And I think this, what he, see here how this goes? So I think what he, that he's quoting Dean C. Davis. I think he's quoting him. And I'll just read. The next question is addressed first to Dr. Storer and then to Dr. Tamplin. The question is, if, he, if human population were subjected to the maximum radiation exposure allowed under the Radiation Protection Guide, would this result in an increase in cancer and a reduction in lifespan? Dr. J. John B. Storer said, This might happen in theory, but in practice it would not be detectable. That is why the standards were set at that level. With respect to the effect of lifespan, the late changes that occur that lead to shortening of the lifespan in animals develop after a long latent period. The lower the dose, the longer the latent period. If the dose is so low that the latent period is longer than the life expectancy, then the effect can never really have an opportunity to manifest itself. So while theoretically shortening life could occur, but in either case, the changes would not be detectable. Dr. Arthur R. Tamplin, I think there's a quote, I am just as curious to see what one means that they would not be detectable. They would be present, but you would not be able to detect them. Dr. Storr, not with the population size available and with the inability to control other variables, there is simply too much noise in the system to detect this particular effect. Dr. Tamplin, well, then you must have some idea of what effect might be numerically. Dr. Storr, sure, you arrive at this by back, by back extrapolating from the studies done on high doses. You put up a conservative model and you assume for this case that it scales linear, linearly, linearly. Then you extrapolate back and get into the numbers game and you can say theoretically that there will be five more cases or ten more cases, but in view of all the errors in the system, you will never be able to detect this effect drastically. Dr. Tamplin. The question is not with your ability to detect it, if indeed it cannot be detected. It is what is the numerical value theoretically. Obviously, if you cannot detect it, if you cannot detect it, there is no other way for you to arrive at it. If the present levels of radiation protection guidelines have been set, as Dr. Russell said, by a group of competent scientific individuals who have weighed this situation carefully, then it must mean that they have an idea of the precise effect of what the precise effect would be, theoretically at least, on a scientific basis." Unquote. The AEC spokesman refused to answer this question at Vermont or anywhere else for that matter. The message which these spokesmen cho choose to convey at Vermont was that exposure at the allowable dosage was safe. Then they indicated nuclear reactors would expose individuals to only a small fraction of this allowable dosage. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. No. Thus, they tried to create the impression that the reactors are more than safe. We know there was no valid basis for indicating that the allowable dosage was safe, and we had only their word for what would be the best resultant dosage from reactors. Upon Tamplin's return from Vermont, we came to two conclusions. One, the AEC had been so shallow and glib that it must have been avoiding some serious problems with respect to the nuclear power industry. And two, if we were going to bring these problems to light, 
We were in for a dirty fight. Both impressions were correct. In one month later, October 1969, when Tamplin went to the symposium at the University of Minnesota, it was only at the insistence of Dr. Abramson that we were invited to the symposium. Prior to going, Tamplin received the following admonition from the symposium chairman, Dr. Harry Foreman. Quote, I am very much looking forward to hearing about your work, but I do have some concern about how you handle your data in relationship to the ICRP standards. The atmosphere in Minnesota is highly charged vis-a-vis -vis nuclear energy and, and doubts and doubts voiced by reputable scientists may well result in a furor that could not only drive nuclear power plants from the state forever, but also any radioactive material used for research and diagnosis. You should be aware that a serious challenge to the safety of the ICRP standards is highly consequential here and should not be made lightly. Of course, if you believe from the basis of your data that the public would be harmed from discharges at the maximum permissible level, then you are free to indicate this at the sessions. You might want to talk this over with Dean or any of us before the sessions." Unquote. It seems that there was a strong desire to have a meeting that would only discuss only the wonders of nuclear reactors. This desire seems to have extended over into editing the proceedings of the symposium. A striking example is discussed in the subsequent chapter on waste disposal, where Dr. Foreman refused to let Dr. M. King Hubert insert some very important material into his paper. At the same time, individuals were permitted to alter their statements in the discussion section or were even allowed to withdraw their comments. If you recall, we stated earlier that the state of Minnesota had proposed a set of regulations governing the release of radionuclides from the Monticello reactor that were 50 times more restrictive than those of the AEC. This set of regulations was paramount in the minds of many of the individuals from the state of Minnesota who attended the symposium. In normal day-to-day -day operations, nuclear power plants are permitted by law to release radioactivity in the form of radioactive atoms into the environment in gaseous and liquid discharges. There are essentially two regulations concerning these releases. The first regulation, which represents the primary standard, is the dosage that is the dosage that could be delivered to an individual or to the population at large. We have discussed this primary standard earlier in this book and we have indicated that the standard is much too high and that it would be a national tragedy for the population at large to be exposed to anything approaching this primary standard of 170 MR per year. I think that's a milliram per year. The second regulation in a group of the second regulation is a group of secondary standards. These are called the maximum permissible concentrations of various radionuclides in the air, MPC, and water, MPCW. So MPCA is maximum permissible concentrations in the air, maximum permissible concentrations in the water has a W on it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start again. I'm sorry about that. The second, reg the second regulation is a group of secondary standards. These are called the maximum permissible concentrations of vari various radionuclides in the air. MPCA and water MPCW that can be released outside of the restricted area of a nuclear reactor. The primary standard should be derived from the secondary standards. But the secondary standards, 
the maximum permissible concentrations that are listed in Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations do not permit this because they do not take into account the biological concentrations mechanisms that actually take place in the environment between the release of activity by the reactor and the eventual consumption of the contaminated foods by man. Wow. So I'm going to end here. Wow, I'm on, it's 20 minutes. I'm sorry I read so long. I'm on page 148. Uh, new subtitle is called Reactor Releases Could Contaminate Food. Huh, you think? So, um, we'll talk to you later, you guys. Put your courage feet on. It is getting grim. Well, what are we going to do except face it? That's what I'm about. So, ciao. Sweet dreams.